Welcome, everyone. So today we're here for another session of Build with Ben, and I want to tackle a problem that's, well, been on my mind quite a bit because... So one of the things as software developers that we often have to do is we have to estimate how long things take, right? And estimates are woo, uh, <laughs> notoriously a difficult thing to do, I think for a number of reasons. One, it's because we don't always know the scope of the work at which we're doing, right? Because after all, we have a couple of problems. One, we're trying to figure out how things are supposed to be done. And then two, as we're doing it, like things come up, right? Either bugs or things don't implement the, the way we want to, so things get delayed. The problem is estimates usually are just essentially gut feelings. But how do we get better at estimates if we never have any sort of feedback in terms of whether or not those estimates are accurate and to what degree? And so obviously the problem with the flip side of this, right? Because people could go, wait, 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 Ben, it's easy. You just have a timer and you just track everything and then you have everything down to the second. Well, that problem comes with a whole series of like administrative work, data entry. And let's face it, that's the last thing most of us want to do is spend the time moving through an Excel spreadsheet, trying to track exactly how many seconds something took. And also more importantly, because it also feels like that's, that essentially gets weaponized against us as developers, because then like, well, by the way, the last time you estimated a CSS bug, you that took you only, you know, 28 minutes. Why is it taking you now, you know, 56 and a half minute? Like, we don't want to weaponize against us. And so unfortunately, I think we have this like almost like polar opposites of like, we're just going to go with our gut and you take it as it will. And then, or we get really granular and then people get, they're afraid of doing anything wrong. So they like either then they blow up their estimates to be super huge. Or, and then it's just hard to develop this skill as a result. And I think mm, it doesn't have to be, I, I feel like there, there's, a, there's a middle ground to that. And that's what we're going to explore today because I think we can design an experience that could help with this. We're not going to solve this problem in a single Build with Ben session, but we're certainly going to investigate some of the patterns and talk about some of those ideas as we build things. So, all right. With that said, let's hop on over to the live screen. Boom. First thing first, let's initialize the project. So I'm going to go ahead and open up. Let's go ahead and open up our terminal. Let's go to projects. And let's go ahead and initialize a new repo. So git repo create, create a new repo. Okay, this is, I'm gonna call it effortless estimates is what I'm calling it. Kind of a cheeky name, but a little bit of alliteration. So there we go, so we make that public. Yes, add a git ignore. Oh, I forgot, I don't want it to do that because I keep thinking the git ignore has like a Node.js or a JavaScript one that's really simple, but it never ever does it quite the way I want it to. So effortless effort. Okay, yes, private. Don't worry about the git ignore. Don't worry about the license right now. Yes, make this public so everyone can see it. And yes, let's clone it locally. Great, effortless effort. Perfect. All right, now what we're gonna do, we're gonna spin up a v3 app. So yarn create, we're gonna do a v app. And so we'll just call this effortless effort. And this will be view. We're just gonna do regular view and then great. Let's open this up. Okay, so we have all this stuff here that I need to move into the root directory. Boom, there we go. And then I think we are essentially good to go once we install all our dependencies. So then yarn dev, I can type. There we go. 3000 over bump on over. Perfect. Let me bump this up a few. 150% looks great. And then, okay, so we have our local. Uh, server running and let's go ahead and make sure we commit set changes is node modules it's automatically ignored perfect git commit config initialize view 3 app with vite boom oh then i mess up the command okay there we go perfect okay so what i'm proposing essentially is that what if we could find a way to track something basically using estimates but then giving people reasonable feedback as far as what exactly they did and how much they, so like how their estimates measure up in relation to reality. Uh, that's kind of what I'd like to see because I think it's similar to like money, right? Like it's one thing to say, how much money have I spent in the month? I think we all have a ballpark idea. Some of us may have a, a better sense of what we spent if we haven't spent as much. But if you have a number of transactions, it's hard to really get a proportion of that, right? And then more importantly, if you're trying to, you know, save, save for like some sort of goal, right? Like you want to go on a trip or you want to buy like the next, you know, console, then knowing what area you can save from makes a big difference as far as your ability to accomplish said goal. And I think estimates are similar in that regard because if, for example, in the money example that we were just talking about, if you're saying like, 
oh, I'd love to cut my video game spendage by 50% and I'll contribute that to my, my next console. Well, here's the thing. If you're actually not spending much money a month, let's say you're only spending $60 a month on games, your $30 a month is going to take you a little while before you actually have like the full amount you need to buy the next-gen console. Whereas if the next-gen console is coming out in June, for instance, well, it's February now. You, don't like, you need to figure out ways to have more impact. And so I think estimates help us in that regard because as we can refine that skill of figuring out where that impact goes and how, how much our time really is being spent, the more we can actually tailor it to the things that we want to spend time on. So... All right, let's set up the uh, initial app, shall we? Let me see, take a look at this. Okay, so let's update some stuff. All right, first thing first, we're gonna just get rid of Hello World, not even gonna worry about it. And then we're gonna get rid of this and we're just gonna say effortless estimate. Let's make sure everything works great. Okay, so now that we have this, I'm gonna, we're gonna have like a little bit of design on this. So what I'm gonna do, we're gonna spend like the first, like 10 minutes or so doing some setup. I thought we'd talk about Pico CSS. So if you haven't heard of this, Pico CSS is, a Pico is a word, to basically it's a super small measurement of something. So you know how there's like centimeter, millimeter, micrometer? Well, there's a Pico meter. And so Pico is just like really, really small. And so the CSS framework is built because it's idea to be, it's designed to be as minimal as humanly possible. And more importantly, it's designed to be done mostly without classes, which I really l like because it basically focuses on you coding with natural HTML elements, and then it just kind of works rather than sort of having to learn an entire CSS framework. Now, granted, it's, it's a starting point. And then beyond that, obviously you still, obviously like you don't get all the bells and whistles that you might get with like a bootstrap material design and some of the other component libraries. But especially when it comes to like building something, just getting a sense of things, I find this a really great place to start. And honestly, it might carry a lot of people a lot farther than they might think. So we're gonna use that for this uh, particular project. So as far as getting started with it, all we need to do is we need to drop in this Pico min CSS. I'm not even gonna, we're not going to complicate things. So all I need to do is come in this index.js here or index.html, drop in our link. And in fact, let's go ahead and change the app title right here. Effortless effort. Perfect. All right, there we go. And then we just need to wipe out some styles so that we have everything really set up from the beginning to be, okay, yep, there's everything from scratch. And we're going to swipe out this hello world. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do now is now that we have this and refresh. Okay, so we've downloaded it. We've linked it. Style CSS. Great. And then all we got to do now is let's wrap this in a main container. And then, and then from here, this is where we can do our effortless CM estimates. Okay, perfect. So now, okay, interesting. Nothing is showing up. I think something broke. Let's just refresh this. Yep, that's right. Let's see, uh, I do see some console log errors though. Let's see what happened. It's looking for Pico CSS and it is not found. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Oh, is it? I see, I see, I see. So it's saying that, oh, this is when you download it. Ha, I have not downloaded it. I just want the CDN link. That's why it's not working. Yes, plan here caught my mistake. I did link it locally. So we're just gonna link to the CDN, that way just keep our efforts easy. And there we go, oh my gosh. Already it looks pretty nice. And in fact, if you don't know what's going on by the way, Pico CSS is actually detecting that I, I think my local preferences is dark mode. So it's gonna automatically build this app in dark mode. But I think though, I probably do wanna go ahead and see if I can swap that out because I think dark mode is a little bit harder for people to see on uh, on the stream. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is see exactly where that's being controlled real quick. Docs, table of contents, layout themes, yep. So turn off dark mode, here we go. So, okay, so I just need to add a data theme light. Okay, that's fine. That's nice and easy. Data theme equals light. And then here we go. Okay, great. There you go, now the contrast should be better for everyone as far as looking at what's going on inside of this. All right, so a couple of things now. So if we're talking about estimates, right, I think the easiest thing to think about when it comes to estimates are probably like the things you have to do. So the scenario I have is, for example, so I play Genshin Impact, which is a video game. And for those who haven't played it, Genshin Impact has a very system when it comes to completing like your dailies, gathering items, and 
all those things. And so if you don't know what dailies are, dailies are essentially like repetitive quests that you have to do each day to gain certain rewards. And so they space them out because they're, the design pattern is essentially to bring you back into the game and have you play it more often. And so the problem is I find myself oftentimes estimating how much time things will take, and I have no idea whether or not my efforts are going into the right place, and more importantly, how much time it's actually taking me. And so I thought we'd go ahead and just do that. So let's go ahead and just sort of scaffold that out as the scenario. So using Pico CSS, let's go ahead and just add a couple of forms. What we're ultimately creating is a series of tasks we need to do, but we need to figure out what their estimates are. That's kind of the big thing here. So if we go into the docs, do, do, do docs, elements. All right, so forms, this is what we want. So it looks like form is fairly simple. We just have uh, the form element. And then let's go ahead and actually permit, prevent any sort of submission on this. And then that's it. So it says label first name, and then that's that. So let's go ahead and drop that in to see what that's like. So we take a look at this. Hey, that looks already super nice. And again, look at this. It's all basically semantic HTML. Nothing crazy here. All right. So new task label. I just call it title. That's what I'll call it. Let me do that. So new task to do title. That's what it's for. Okay. New task title here. Placeholder. Placeholder task title. Okay. Great. Now that we have this, we can then create our tasks to basically say what we need to do. And so this should be fairly easy to wire up. So let me go ahead and hide some stuff so it's easier for people to see. We'll go ahead and start by, we'll use the composition API and just say the ref. So basically we're going to create a reactive object. And what was that import? Okay. Cons uh, new task title equals ref empty string. And then we'll go ahead and say v model new task title. So to make sure this works, we'll go ahead, as I always do, I'll go ahead and make sure that it's actually rendering correctly. This is my task. Perfect. Great. So we know that that's hooked up correctly. And now what we need to do is simply just um, add it to a list. So we'll say h2 here. And we'll say tasks, right? So there you go. Oh, I like how easy this is. Look how, like... It just starts to, it just looks way better as a result. So let's say new task, task. All right, great. This is already, I mean, spacing, I could do some changes, but it's fine. So we have the task we need to do is just going to be a list. And then we'll just say v4 task in task list. Key will be a task. Do, do, do. Let's see. We're just going to keep this simple for now. So just use the index. And then we'll just say task. Let's see. Index. Let's see, string actually, and then do task index. That's all we need to do. And then after that, we can print out the task dot title. Okay, and so what we want to do here is that on key up dot enter, we will add task. And so we'll need to do a couple of things here. So cons, I said task list is a ref. It'll be an empty array. And then we have the ability to add the task, which will basically then say task list dot value push. The title dot value, which is fine. And then we'll need some other properties later, which we'll add. And then we'll reset the property, which is good. Back down to res uh, nothing. And then that is it, I think. So for example, if I need to farm Ting Ting flowers, which is something I need to do, great. And then I need to also go ahead and we need to also say, let's say, uh, purchase gems from shop. Okay, great. Everything's added. Fairly simple wiring up. What we're gonna do real quick though, so I'm gonna go ahead and let's just commit this like really basic, this like sort of starter UI. So let's go ahead and commit this. Git commit feature add starter UI for the app. Okay, the other thing I wanna do real quick though is that the problem is that if we refresh this, right? Everything should just disappear. And so what we wanna do is let's just use some local storage. And we're gonna use a library we talked about on a previous stream called view use. And I want to try out this use local storage. Oh, okay. We have actually a great question here that actually comes at a great point. So uh, Chikom San here, first time chat. Hello, thanks for joining. So, all right, let's talk about view real quick. I should have actually done this at the very beginning, but this now is as good a time as any. So in case you didn't know, view three is now the official starting point for all view projects. And for a long time, it was view two. We've officially switched to version three as the starter point. So when you install view, that's where you start out. And so to Chikom-san's question here, Vue is a framework 
Well, <laughs> that's the only thing. The definition of framework has always been kind of tricky, right? But basically, yes, it is a framework. I would say also React has become more of a framework. I know that React constantly says that it's a library, but in that regard, it all depends on how you use it, right? React with the CLI and all its opinion is essentially a framework. If you include it as a library, then yes, you could say that React is a library. But then by the same argument, Vue has that same ability too. We can also just drop it in as uh, just a CDN library and then just let it work. It can work literally as a functional library. And so uh, Sarah Drasner actually wrote this great post about you don't need jQuery Vue. Let's see, replacing jQuery with Vue. I think this is the one. Yeah. So this is the article and I'll make sure to drop this in the resources so people have this. In fact, I'll drop this in the chat though. And so this is so, let me drop that. Okay. And so, yeah, so clearly like Sergio here, there are lots of discussions happening, but Vue is very flexible. It is a progressive framework. So honestly, I think, I think most people, when they think of Vue, you really should think of it as React as far as like a framework that, oh, actually, oh my God, I myself am getting, just throwing the terms all around because again, it's one of those things where like the frameworks can be used to build different types of applications essentially. So that's why I think Sergio is correct. It is more like React in that it's flexible. It can be a framework for you when you want a full-blown sort of opinionated structure. On the other hand, you have the ability to include it more as a library. And so actually here to plan's point, so the new view docs has something that's pretty cool. And so you can see here that when you're coming through, one of the big things about Vue 3 is that it introduces the composition API, which is a new way of writing code. And so for those who are going through the docs, they might not want to maybe start learning the options API, which is how we basically recommend it for people to start with. Maybe they know that they want to start with the composition API. So how might that be? And so you can see here that if we're looking here, this right here is doing just sort of, actually, let me do something different. Let me do like computer properties. So here, computer properties, you'll notice that it's sort of explaining everything here in this sort of like style that is ultimately the composition API. But if we swap it over here to the options API, you'll see that you can see a different way of how it's basically written, how the code examples are. And it's as simple as toggling between the two styles to see what it looks like in the docs. And so super, we're very excited to have this. Hopefully y'all will uh, get a chance to check it out. If you have any feedback as far as the docs, please feel free to let us know. But yeah, this is super exciting. So chikom san hopefully that helped to answer your question. Okay, so jumping back in, what we're doing now is we're gonna use this utility library called ViewUse to make using local storage super, super easy. And so looking at the docs right here, it already tells me to refer to use storage and not use local storage. So I will listen to the docs because I certainly don't think I know better than the docs. So as we can see here, this is pretty neat because as we can see the usage here, we import a light, we import a function here from view use core, and then we just use it and store it there. And then we can call it from that. So state dot value state. Yeah. Okay. This is cool. So, I'm not, let's just let's just use it. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go ahead and npm install view use slash core. That should do it. Although I just realized that I use npm or I use yarn. Uh, yarn. I don't think it matters actually. I think it did do it. Oh no, the problem is I have the package that lock. Never mind. Let me move this to trash. Let me do this again. Yarn add view use slash core. In fact, let me double check that real quick to make sure I got that right. I'm pretty sure I did. Do, 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 view use. I get started. NPM, you, yep, view use core. I was good. I had that memorized. Excellent. Okay, boom. Now that we have that in here, we should be able to do what I, what I want to do regarding the use storage. So rather than having the task list be something that's being stored just merely inside of the web app, we're going to import use storage from view use slash core. And so now what we can do here is I believe do use storage and I'm going to call this task list like this. And then task list is going to be this empty array. And then once we have that, we should be able to then bind. So we bound an array, bound storage, and then that should be it actually. Okay. Let's see if this works. So a couple of ways we can test this is one inside of our Chrome dev tools here, we can go inside of the application and we can look inside of local storage. So what we're going to see in here actually is you already see that task list actually does show up. So let's see what happens when we change stuff. So I said, I said I need to farm Ting Sing. So there we go. Check that out. There it is right in the reactive variable already. So then I can go purchase gems from the store. Okay. Awesome. So now if we go ahead and refresh this, 
it looks like we're good. In fact, let me, let's just actually show that happening. So I'm going to close it and then reopen it. And yes, our data is stored. So easy. Ah, so good. Big thanks to Anthony and team for creating this little utility for us because now local search is that much easier. It just feels like you're using, you're just setting a reactive reference here. And then after that, you use it in your app just like you would. And it takes care of the local storage stuff for you. Love it. This, this is the kind of abstraction I absolutely love. Okay, so now we don't have to worry about re-entering data multiple times during the stream, which is something that I've learned over time. So, ah, so excited. Okay, so now that we have this stuff, I think we have the basis of the app more or less. The only thing I wanna do differently is let's go ahead and style this real quick. And I wanna see if Pico has a component we can use. To just make this look a little bit nicer. Okay, they do have cards. I think cards would be more than adequate. So, this is a card. This is a card. Okay. So if that's the case, then I could say, is this a class card? Oh, every time it's an article, it's a card. Okay. Let's just test this real quick. I don't let's see article and then wrap the title with it and let's see what happens. Oh, okay. Yeah, that works for me. That totally works for me. Class. I'll just say task list item because this time, so this is where you start to augment, right? You have your base stuff and then that's that. Ah, I see wing here in the chat. Yeah, that is super handy. Yeah, I know, right? Local storage in one line of code because then you use it just like you would other things. Like rather than ref, it's just use storage, give it an assigned key for your local storage and the value and it takes care of the rest from there. Ah, I'm so stoked. Okay, so list, task list items. Let's go ahead and add a scoped attribute to this task list item, and then list style none. That's what I want. Save. Great. And then I just want to go ahead and reduce the padding on this. Is it padding? No. Margin? Margin. Neither. Okay. So I think maybe it's a task list itself is where it's coming from. So if I say task list padding zero, give this a class of uh, task list, save. There we go, now it's gone. Okay, so I can remove the, these two, didn't do anything. Okay, so now we have our task, looks good. Now the question is, we wanna be able to then say, okay, did, like, how long is this thing going to take, right? The user needs to be able to define this. So within the task list item, I would argue here that probably we need to then have an actual input for the estimate. So let's just say input type number, and then let's just see what ha like how that looks like. Oh, that's kind of brutal. Okay, can I give this task list card? Okay, this is starting to get a little bit long. So I'm just call it like a task card is what we're just gonna call it. So a task card will be displayed flex. There we go, very good. And then more importantly though, we want the first element this is what we want to be like the flex. We want everything else to be kind of small because the, the number we're gonna say, it should really only be a certain width. So if that's the case and I say like flex one, and then we have the task.title in here, that is looking okay, but I really did want this width to be a little bit more compact to be honest. So, oh, I did not write that CSS property correctly. Okay, much better. So we have the farm team team, this is great. And then we can align items here, center. Okay, this is looking pretty good. And then, okay, padding, what's going on here? Oh, this input has a margin. All right, what if I just get rid of the margin? That way it doesn't look so uneven, great. That's good. And then is this also have a margin too? Yep, we're gonna get rid of this margin real quick. Hey, I see Jacob in the chat. What's up? Okay, good. Our card looks good. And then we can basically say we know for a fact that this is the input. And then we can, let's say, well, let's just assume that everything is by minutes, okay? Let's just assume that. So I'll just give this like a 10 pixel right margin, great. So now we can go ahead and add as many minutes as we want. It looks like that is a little bit high. So let's do, there we go. And then, oof, that is not big enough because of the opinions here. Okay, that 12, 60, 120. Yeah, it's a little tight. So let's bump this up just a smidge more. Okay, now we have this toggle option. Great. Okay, 
So we want the ability then to update the estimate on the task. That's the next thing we got to do, right? So this is actually fairly simple. All we need to do here is within said task, we're going to actually add a V model to this uh, specific task and say it'll belong to the estimate of a task. And so if you're wondering like, oh, we don't have that property yet. Don't worry. We're going to do that right now. So we can, every time we have this, this will be a new thing and this will just be zero. So if things is works correctly the way I wanted to, we could say, let's say it takes 15 minutes to farm and I'm estimating and it takes 10 minutes to do this. Okay. So if this works the way I wanted to, and we check our dev tools, we could see that in application local storage task list, this is good. You'll see that our estimates have been updated correctly inside of local storage. Perfect. That's exactly what we want. All right. This is good. I'm realizing though, with the amount of space this is taking up, oh my gosh, look how much space is taking up. Hang on. Let's go ahead and bump this down a little bit. So I'm just going to do some inline styles for now because we're just prototyping things. So there we go. That bumps a little bit. Let's, let's do that a little bit more. Margin top 10 pixels, 20 better. All right, great. Now this is not so daunting because the H2s are kind of big. It might partially be the, the fact that I'm zoomed in a bit, but I wanted people to make sure they could actually read everything. So I just want to make sure things are bumped up a little bit more to be cleaner. Yeah, okay. This is looking um, much, much better already. So I'm just going to go ahead and just drop this over here for this H2 real quick. That's cleaner. Excellent. All right. Oh, plan is like, we could also change the CSS variables. Oh, that's a great, let's see, custom, can we extend utilities? Oh, that's what, okay, plan is referring to. Okay, so inside of here, if you look inside, there is a typography spacing vertical. Ha, you are totally right, plan here with an excellent shout out. So let's do it the proper way, shall we? So we can see here that margin bottom is being changed by this variable right here. So what we can do here is let's go ahead and wipe all this out real quick. Oh, I went too far. That's gone. That's gone. And that's gone. Okay, save. Everything bumps out as expected. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to say inside of the... Actually, I don't know if root is going to work here. But that's okay. Let's do that and see if this works. This refresh. I think the scope ruins the root because our spacing vertical is defined on the H1 and it's not showing up. So what if I did this? Save and then refresh. Okay, there we go. And then can I scope this to make it even better? Scoped. This looks like this works. So just the root. Root doesn't work on scoped. It clearly has some issues there. That's fine. So we can do that. And then I can just do H1, H2 like that. And then, oh, that's just so much cleaner. Look at that. So nice. Although, actually, I'd argue, though, that H2 probably should just be a, a smidge smaller. So we're going to make this 10 pixels. And there we go. Although, why is this one still showing up like that? The task still has a gigantic... Oh, the, the margin is correct. Oh, it's this thing right here. Task card. Task card. Block spacing vertical. Ah, uh, that's what it is. Okay, well, this is a one-off right now, so I don't want to worry too much about it. Okay. Excellent. Let's go. Okay, so what we have here, we have the ability to add estimates to our task. This is good. So let's go ahead and commit that. So, okay, we added some stuff. Git commit feature. Use local storage and add estimates. That's basically what we did in that. Okay. So, oh, no, did I scroll? Do, do, do. Bum bum. <laughs> I see Wingnut here in the chat. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed this. The chat had paused. No Fibonacci sequence story point selector drop down. You know what though? The thing is, is arguably you could. We could totally run a comparator against that, but that is probably going to go beyond the scope <laughs> of this particular task. So I think I want to illustrate what, in my mind, good estimate experience could be like. And then there was certainly need to be refinement over time, but I hopefully this will form the foundation. If other people are building similar software like this, I don't, I don't care if you use a similar idea because I think it'll make everyone's life easier. And if everyone's life is easier to do this kind of stuff and they can get better estimates, I think the world will just be a better place. Because again, we'll, we'll build things faster. People will be able to actually make trade-offs. Anyways. Okay, so now that we have this stuff, we have the estimate. What do we need to do? We need to actually be able to then do basically a countdown. That's ultimately what we need to be able to do. 
And so what we need to do is take this 15 and then turn it into something that like we can watch countdown. All right, so how are we gonna do this? First thing first, I think what makes the most sense is one, I realize I need to put this in a, okay, we're gonna need a div for this. Whoops, what's just happened here? App.view, I'm gonna take this whole thing, let's wrap it in a div. And then what if I add a button here that says like a start? Okay, so that's pretty extreme. Oof, I'm trying to think how I'm gonna do this. Wrap this in a div and then style margin bottom 15 pixels. Okay, for the sake of let's focusing on the key part is now we have a start button. When we hit the start button, we want this thing to change because we want to be able to say, this is how much time is remaining, right? If you're starting a task, you should be able to do this. So let's wire this up. So what we want to be able to do is we want to say start timer and then we're going to pass in, though, the uh, task at hand because we need to know exactly which one to modify. So, yeah, I see radio signal here in the chat. Yes, how's it going? Uh, yes, today is a View 3 session while also talking through some ideas around the user experience behind task estimates, which I think um, are a core thing, to be honest, that are, that are core to developers as well as just, I think, people in general. Like, estimating tasks is just hard. Why should it... Why, can, why don't we find a way to get better at it as a skill? That's like the whole theme of this particular stream. Okay, so we've got this. We've got to start the timer, start the task. Okay, to show that this works, we can say start timer, and we know that we're going to receive a task as the first argument. So what we can do then is we can, let's just log the task.estimate to prove that this works. So if we go inside of here, inside of this, great, and click start, great, we get 15. And what we're, another assumption we're going to make with this app as well is that we're going to assume that whatever we type in is going to be in uh, minutes for that particular one. So what we need to do now is be able to convert this over in a way that lets us set the interval and then change it over time. And this is what's going to be a little bit tricky. So let's think this through. So the first thing we're definitely going to need is the set interval function from JavaScript. So let's go ahead and pull that up so that everyone, um, in case you're new to it, we can look at it together. All right, so set interval. Here's the MDM docs for it. Essentially what we want to do is every second that goes by, we want to live update the timer so that it will tick down, but we're going to do more than that because otherwise I would just have called this a countdown app. Again, I want to go beyond this. So set interval has two parts, right? We can set the function that we're going to call and how much it's going to delay. So to show that this works, what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple of things. So what I'm going to introduce you to another library that I think is super useful, which is date functions. And so most of you are probably familiar with the moment JS, which is essentially to handle time and that kind of stuff. Date functions is like the evolution of that. And so I think this is a great description right here. It's the low dash for dates. It gives you different utility functions, just like we use for the view use core for local storage in order to manage dates. And so just to keep our lives a little bit easier, we're just going to use their built-in stuff, even though I'm sure some of you are thinking like, oh, some of these equations we could easily do ourselves. Just for the sake of simplicity and just exposure too to new stuff, let's go ahead and use date functions. So I'm going to go ahead and add date functions to our project. And then we're going to convert minutes to seconds. So here we go, convert minutes to seconds. And all we got to do now is import this from here. And so now... If this works the way I hope it will, we'll have the estimates. And so the estimate too will just say minutes. And then if this works the way I hope it does, minutes to seconds, it should just take a number, which will be our task.estimate. And this will be it in seconds. So, ooh, I missed up the typing. Okay, save. Okay, looks good so far. And then we're gonna go ahead and click start. Okay, this is great. We are seeing, we're seeing the right calculations here. So, yeah, okay, I'll wing that here. I see Jacob here. Lo shout out love for date functions. Wing that. Oh, nice. Always love to learn more about streamlined date function packages. Moment can take just a couple moments to load sometimes. And that's exactly it, right? Like the, the authors of Moment.js knew the problems with it as a library, which was that performance was a problem. You loaded a huge library for oftentimes when you needed basically specific utility functions. And so hence, date functions is basically the new standard, I would say. I'd be willing to go that far. As far as the community for using, for doing all your sort of date calculations. So 
whether it's like intervals, distances, like calculating the time between dates. Because you'd be so shocked at like, when you think about it, when you're managing dates, how simple those problems seem to be. But without those utility functions, you'd have to like do all sorts of like checking what month it is. Because, you know, month February has 28 days. But wait, if it's a leap year, February needs 29 days. And you realize that like there's a lot of logic that goes into proper date time calculation. And thankfully, date functions does basically, it takes care of most of all that for you. So you'll probably see this more on the stream. It's one of my favorite libraries, to be honest, because I think time is a really important thing to manage. And um, huge, I'm hugely grateful to the authors of Date Functions for making this easier for us so we can focus on other things. Okay, so now that we have this, we okay, so it's cool. So we have seconds. This is good. And now we need to do a couple of things. Well, how am I going to do this? This is a little bit weird. Because what we need to do is we need to actually display the remaining time. So I'm not going to worry too much about the UI right now. What I am going to do, though, is try to show like the text for the remaining time, right? So let's say this is another div. And let's say remaining time. And theoretically, it should look something like this. 15 minutes and 0 seconds. Let's see. 0, 0 like this. Let, let's go as far as that. Okay, remaining time, 0, 0, 15. This is good. Don't love the way this looks. Let me go ahead and just style this real quick. Margin, bottom, let's just say 10 pixels. Yeah, just a little bit of padding. That's good. That will count down. This will change. This is good. And then I'm just going to make this bold. Let's wrap that in a strong tag. Okay, good. Okay, I'm, I'm good with this. Although, really, once we set it, it should be below the input. So I'm just going to do one more refactor here. That's pretty... Maybe it's... Bottom is 15, like this. OK, I am happy with that. That looks good enough. So this is what we need to change, right? When we hit Start, we want to basically be running a calculation on the different pieces. So there's a couple of ways to do this. And I'm just going to go with gut instinct, and we'll figure out from there. So the first thing first is we need to figure out how much time is left as it goes down. So actually, the first thing we can do, to be honest, is we'll probably have a we need to have a, some sort of reactive reference to the remaining time left. And so for now, let's just globalize this to start. Because I think otherwise, well, no, you need to be able to try individual ones. So I take that back. So most likely every property will need a remaining time. And so let's do this. So when we start the timer, we'll do this. We'll say task.remaining. So the time that's remaining is going to be minutes. Okay, this is actually good. We'll do it like this, task.remaining. So if this works the way I hope it will, we can do task.remaining, and then this should still give us the same exact res result as before. So there we go, 900 seconds. This one should be 600. Okay, great. So that's correct. Now what we need to do, is we need to say set interval. And what are we going to do inside of this function, right? Inside of this function, we're going to say task.remaining minus minus and then we'll do this every second and so if you didn't know basically the set interval does it in milliseconds rather than seconds so that's why we need to do the uh the thousand right there so i think this should do the trick and what we can do then is i'm gonna go ahead and rather than display this sort of placeholder time we'll do task.remaining and then if it's if it actually exists because right now we know some of our properties don't but otherwise display just zero so there we go. OK, great. This is good. So remaining time, 900, 600. This is good. I'm happy here. So now if we click Start, we should see this counting down. OK, great. This is exciting. Now we need to be able to stop this thing. <laughs> That's the next thing we need to do. So let's, let's quickly scaffold that up. So button, click, stop timer, task. Let me see. If I refresh, I think it'll kill it. Hold up, refresh. Okay, so if I refresh it, it stopped the timer. It looks like it's at 881. That's totally fine. So stop timer is going to be a whole nother function that we're going to have. So stop timer is also going to take the task in. And then this is where we ultimately need to use another function called clear interval. And so clear interval basically will uh, take the ID of the interval and then allow you to basically uh, stop it from happening. And so the example here that we see, clear interval, interval ID. So right now we're not tracking the interval ID, and that's something that we need to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to do a global interval 
uh, ID. And that'll be a ref that is empty. And then we're going to go ahead and do interval ID. It's going to be set interval like this. Oh, interval. Oh, wait, not inter, uh, sorry, not const. So I'm declaring a new one. This is a reactive value. So that's that. And then here, when we want to stop the task, we would, oh, actually, we don't even need the task, actually. We could just say clear interval, interval ID dot value. Great. So I can simplify the call down here to not even take in a parameter. And then we can save. Okay, so if this works the way I hope it does, and we hit the stop button. Actually, I wonder if Pico CSS has a... See you later, Matt. Thanks for stopping by. Now let's see if it has a... I want to see if the button has like just a different color. I just need something that's not as obvious. Uh, secondary, I mean, that's fine. Class, secondary, uh, secondary save. So just give us a little bit of a UI diff. Okay, yep, that's good enough for me. Excellent. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, so now if this works, we can start the timer. Oh, it started at 900. And then we click stop, stop, does it, start again, starts at the very beginning. Okay, this is interesting. And we this is technically a bug, but it's actually by intention because every time we set the remaining at the very beginning. So what we probably want to do then is this. We want to do if task remaining exists, right? If it already has that property, then great. Like you can just run this. So actually, no, other way around. If you do not have task remaining, this is what we want to do. Then this is where we can say task are remaining equals this. So basically checking for that. Otherwise, regardless of what it is, we're going to go ahead and set an interval to go ahead and just basically set a set the interval on that. So then we can go ahead and say start, and then we can stop. If I start again, that's good. Stop, refresh. Looks like that's good. And then just double check once, double, triple check. Local storage here. I know y'all can't see it, so I'll bump it over here. Yep, remaining time 860. Okay, great. This is good. So I see a question here from Sergio. Is there a date function function that changes the display of the seconds to HHMM SS format? That is a great question and actually something that we need to do now because we have the seconds. It would be nice if date functions could actually show us this. So I was trying to figure this out earlier, but seconds to hours. So they have, they clearly have an ability to go from seconds to hours, second to minutes, second to seconds. Or why would you do second to seconds? <laughs> it's already seconds. The question is, is how do you like uh, display? So maybe it's like format, you know, format time, dura oh, format duration. Maybe that's what I want. So we can, okay, let me bump this up. Actually, this is probably super small for people. So let's go ahead and bump that up. Format duration takes a duration and duration can be months, years. The default is here. And then what comes out as a result? So if you format this duration, it'll do this. Okay, nine months, that's fine. But that, that assumes that you already know, it, like you literally know what everything should be. And otherwise, we'd have to basically run calculations to do this. So that's not quite what I want. Format distance to now, format duration, format ISO, format relative base date, format. Okay, let's let's do a little going. Date functions, format time from seconds. Format a duration from seconds. So someone else asks, given this value to this. Interval to duration is apparently what they want. So if you do interval to duration, that will give you, okay, that'll give you the object that you need to then do the thing. Okay, this is great. So Sergio's question, perfectly timed. Let's go ahead and try this out. So we want interval, which is the time interval to duration. This is good. So if we take a look at this, it's another utility function. And inside of here, what we get is the ability to say where it starts and where it ends. Okay, but then this assumes you know the seconds and what are the two duration objects? Let me look back at that Stack Overflow post real quick. Start zero, n seconds times a thousand. Oh, okay. I mean, heck, if it's that easy, the documentation does not make it that obvious to be honest. I would say that my first gut looking at the documentation is that I need it to be a date. It According to 
what we just read though from Stack Overflow, in which I, I well, to be honest, is what I would would hope for for an API design for something like this, is that it doesn't have to be that way. So to show that this works, we're gonna go ahead and say, we're gonna go ahead and try out just the log to show what's going on. So every time we'll log out interval to duration, interval to duration, zero, and then we'll do task dot remaining times a thousand because it's we need it to be in millisecond, I guess, for this to work correctly. So let's find out if this works. So now we're here inside of here, console log, and let's start. So start date is invalid. Okay, so that's already a little bit of a problem. So I, I had a, I was kind of hoping it wouldn't. This is done way back in, yeah, interval to duration. This was not that long ago. Okay, let me check this real quick. Go to original issue, start and custom format duration. Oh, here we go. Interval start end. Oh, I totally botched that. Start, end, there we go. Now we can save, refresh. Okay, now we can try again. Years, months, minutes. Oh, it worked. Oh, snap. Okay, hold up, let's stop. Let's see what we get. We get minutes, seconds, minutes, seconds, minutes, seconds, yes. Okay, this is exactly what we want. Because now that we have this, we can then say that's super cool because I think now that this is being tracked, we could probably run a computer property based on, uh, well, no, technically it would be a method because it's being run every single time. So what I'm saying. So I'm saying const generate timestamp. I'm going to call it a timestamp for now. I think that's right. So then what we're going to do, we're going to take the task and then we're going to say const duration is equal to interval to duration. I uh, know remaining time label, I think is the better description. It'll take the task and then task that remaining, multiply that by a hundred. Then what we're going to return is we're going to return the remaining time label dot hours, minutes. Okay, let's just see if this works, right? So if this works the way I hope it will, and then we run, do, 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 do. let's just drop it here, generate timestamp with task. We can see that it it is 14 minutes here. That's good. Now let's just go ahead and add the seconds. I wonder, I don't know if this will trigger every single time though. So I think this is, I think why we may need a watch function. But let's just do remaining time label that seconds, seconds, seven seconds, start. It just works. Oh, the method just works. I was not expecting that. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> win. Big win, big win, big win, big win. Okay. So we can stop this. And we can actually then just delete that. There we go. Now we have our hours, minutes, and seconds for the remaining time. And so how can we push this further, right? Because we're talking about estimates. This is the problem I want to solve. So let me run down my scene. We can resume the timer, start. Okay, that's fine. We can resume. So I, I did, let me, hold, let me do my checklist real quick. I did that, did this. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, so what we want to be able to do though is mark a task as complete, right? So let's add another button here. And this time for this button, we're just going to use contrast just to switch it up. And contrast is going to complete the task. We're just going to keep this complete task like that. And then there we go. And then we'll have a meth. Oh wait, you know what? I'm getting a little ahead of myself, I realize. Let me save this real quick. Remember, we are all about micro commits on this screen because on the stream, because we've gone ahead and we've done something pretty big. We've gone ahead and updated this. So we'll say the feature here is add ability to display, to display remaining time in human readable form. Great. 
Sergio here is suggesting that we go ahead and use a computed prop for the generated time. So the computed property will be possible if we I think we componentize this because right now the computed property is would be relying on a very specific task because arguably like when I come in here, this should be able to track its own state. So I think in order to do the refactoring you're talking about, Sergio, we would need to actually refactor into its own component because right now our computed property would essentially need to take an argument because we need to know which one it's generating for. So arguably, let's see, 12. You know what, Sergio, you made the request. We're making it happen. Okay, we're going to go ahead and now refactor this into its own component because at this point, I think Sergio is on the money with this. Let's do it. So what we're going to do here, I'm just call it a task card view. Let's go ahead and set up the single file component real quick. And then let's go ahead and move some stuff over. So the card itself is just going to be this article, essentially. So if I cut all this and save, everything should disappear. That's as intended. So everything, boom, save here. We are missing some stuff here, but we'll deal with those errors shortly. So inside of this, we're going to go ahead and create task card components and they will receive the task at hand. So that is basically the singular prop I think we really need to worry about. So inside of here, ins we'll go ahead and uh, cons props equals define props, and we'll get a task, which is gonna be an object. And so actually I don't need props right now, so this should be adequate. So there we go, let's have that. Now that we have define props set here, we need to, let's see, things should be breaking, I think. Yep, they're breaking, that's fine. So it's unable to resolve the component, which totally makes sense because we need to actually import that component. So import task card from components task card. Great. So we save that now. Uh, let me do dot view actually, just to be very clear. Uh, compiler is broken and probably because we're missing functions. Yep. It's saying, hey, what is all this stuff you're talking about? I don't know what that is. So generate timestamp needs to move and looks like start timer and stop to all of this needs to move. So we're gonna refactor this by moving all this over. And let me go ahead and hide this. We'll drop this in here so we have all of that. But we need a couple more things. We need these things cut out. So cutting those over and let's drop them over here. So now I think we have mostly what the logic that is now encapsulated to this specific component. As you see, everything is now showing up. This is great. So we have the props.task. So the only thing though, is that we need to actually refer to the, the actual task at hand. So now, rather than having generate timestamp uh, to Sergio's point using a method, which doesn't actually properly cache things, so basically re-rendering it every time, we wanna leverage caching without doing a bunch of extra work. So I think the only thing I need to do real quick is just make sure task is correct here, but we can actually remove this. And I think we actually can even remove the start timer because we'll know what it is. So let's refactor that real quick. So start timer doesn't need a specific task because we only have one task in this component. So we could say it props.task.remaining, props.task. Ooh, well that, I think that'll work. And then props.task.estimate and then props.task.remaining. Ooh, this will be interesting to see if this actually works. This is looking funny. That's fine. Props that tasks are remaining. And then we're not going to do this. And we're going to do this real quick. So we're going to do a computer property, just as Sergio mentioned here, just like that. That means we need to import computed here. And then, oh yeah, it should be props. So props, 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 save. Okay, already looking better. So now the computer property is watching props.task. So if we start it now, it is, oh, there we go. There we go, now it goes. And now we can see, it looks like everything is working as expected. And then if we stop it here, we should see an update inside of our application for here. So let's go ahead and bring this up so y'all can see this. 817 is what's currently being here. And so if we go ahead and do that, 15, 14, yeah, everything's working exactly as we expect. Okay, this is great. So just with this refactoring now, we've isolated basically all our logic from our card inside of a single component, and which makes our initial app here even cleaner. 
So this is a big win. Oh, you know what? I got to do one more thing. We got to move all this task card stuff over because the styles belong there. They no longer belong inside of this. So we're going to hand scoped. All right, excellent. So Sergio, thanks for the support. Yeah, it was your suggestion that motivated me to do that refactor. So I appreciate the suggestion there. So keep them coming. All right, so we have these two things. We did a refactor, move a uh, task card into its own component, basically is all we did. All right, now we were talking about the ability to complete the task and how to log things. Because again, to me, it's all about analysis at the end of the day. That's really what we ultimately care about. So I had the button copied for complete tasks. <laughs> Greetings from View Athens. Yes, yes. For those who don't know, uh, View Athens is a meetup that I, I spoke at. I think it was late last year. And so they're a great group. So if you're ever looking for speaking opportunities, be sure to check them out. So, all right. All right, so here we have that. We are gonna go ahead and we're gonna add our complete task button. And then this time we don't actually need the task because again, we're inside of our own scope now, which is super nice. So now we can go ahead and add a method. All right, we're getting to the point where this is where you want to talk about like drawbacks of composition API. Like I like having things be very clearly delineated for the most part. So for now, I'm just going to make this one. These are computed properties. This, I'll, use, I'll use basically co code blocks, comment blocks. These are my, this is my methods section. Okay, start timer, stop timer, complete task. And this is a function, what are we gonna do? We're gonna actually, it's gonna be a little bit more complicated than what you would normally do because we wanna actually give more information than simply what we wanna do. I had a feeling someone was gonna bring that up. So plan here in the, in the chat has a question regarding in view two, there was a warning if you change the prop directly, did that change in view three? As of right now, we're not seeing any warnings as far as directly mutating the prop. And so that is an excellent call out. So there is a question of like, does it make more sense architecturally speaking to just mutate the prop or does it make more sense to kind of have it sort of echo back up? And so clearly at this point, there doesn't seem to be at least a technical limitation from Vue's perspective as far as that kind of thing. One could argue though, that if we're talking about having less like two-way dependency, the traditional model of having our task sort of, sort of the task being, the single source of truth being at the very top would mean that we basically want the ability to probably emit the updated information to the to the parent. And that's one way to kind of handle it rather than mutating props directly, which can be rather messy. And so actually, so rather, so actually, you know what, we'll go ahead and do that refactor plan as part of this. Because I actually do think that model is a bit cleaner than just mutating the props directly. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll do that refactor just in a bit. So when we complete a task, this is something we need to do though, is that the, the task itself actually needs a property to track the actual time that it took to, to complete. So essentially just to document this schema real quick, we're gonna go ahead and basically there's, there's an estimate, there's a remaining time, but then I would also say there is the actual time, right? So or how about say, let's call it completion. And uh, so this is like the completion time. And what we ultimately want to do is when we complete the task, we want to go ahead and say props.task. Okay, so, oh, sorry, if props. well, no. Props.task.complete, did I say complete or completion? Completion. All right, so the completion attribute of the task will then equal the props.task.remaining. I believe that's what we want. Okay, and to show that works, we'll basically say that inside of our card, so here we have the title. And so the title, to be honest, probably deserves to be a little bit more prominent. So I'm just gonna go ahead and quickly just make it a 1.5 rem font weight bold. I see Elenma here in the chat. Hello, how's it going? Uh, okay, that's a little bit bigger. And then now what I wanna do real quick is show whether it's completed or not. So completed if uh, task.completion is true. So then we can just go ahead and mark that. And then I'll v if task.completion. Okay. So 
if this works the way I hope it would, when we hit complete, there we go. We have a completed here. And I realize we're going to wrap this here in a div because flex is being funky. Oh, that's interesting. Style flex one. There we go. Much better. All right. That looks cleaner. Okay. So when we have a completed, we essentially get a timestamp, which is nice because we can say, okay, this is the completed bit. And then, so if I go ahead and do that a couple more times, so two more seconds off, we should see um, here. Oh, oh, that's a bug. So if I click start multiple times, it's going to create multiple timers. So that would be a bug we'd want to, we'd want to, we'd want to basically disable the ability. Once you click it once, we'd, we technically want to disable that. So we'll figure that out just in a bit. So I stop it. If I hit complete, this is the amount of time remaining. Okay, so now that we know this, we want to be able to actually say what exactly, now that it's complete, we want to be able to compare that to our estimate. So at this point, we should have some sort of computer property that says, based on the sort of like the gap, how did you do? So one could argue then if we call it like, let's call this p tag. Uh, status and then what might this be like so if the original estimate will say 15 minutes and you finish at 10 minutes you say great you finish with five minutes to spare right or you finish like fat like you were faster than your estimate and then on the other hand you also want to know if you were over your estimate so let's start with the simple path of if you're under your estimate so if you're under your estimate then you basically want to know the difference between the two so if I look at if I think of that as a computer property then what we're ultimately saying is that let's say com, let's say estimate status is what I'm going to call it or I'll say estimate analysis is what it is. We're analyzing how the two compare. And so the estimate analysis that we just said, right, is ultimately uh, we're going to say the task dot remaining or sorry, completion. So the actual completion task minus the task dot estimate. That should be what's remaining. So if we do this correctly, and I displayed this the way I think it should, task dot, what did I call it? Com analysis, estimate analysis. Gotta love autocomplete. Oof, that makes sense. Cause yeah, this makes sense actually, because I think the reason it's breaking is because it doesn't always have these properties. So for now, again, normally you'd have like probably standardization on your data models, but for now, let's just do this, empty return false. Okay, so now if I refresh this, ah, oh, everything broke. Yarn dev, refresh, whoop. Okay, it really did not like that. Task is not defined. Well, of course task is not defined. Silly me, this is the props. So there we go. Props, there we go. Status, okay. So what we see here is the completion time minus the task estimate. And we end up getting a huge number because positive means you are faster and we need to know by how much and you're faster by this much time. Okay. This makes sense. So using this interval to duration thing, we could then say, okay, okay, okay. So here we go. So const time. Uh, I'll just say time diff is this and then return interval to duration of the oh, actually no 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 so we want to do const time diff label where breakdown ah details equals interval to duration of right and we have two things we have the start which is going to be zero and then we're going to have the t end time, which is the time diff times 1000, because that's in seconds. Then we can return the label, which is going to be just like before, actually. So I'm just going to copy this real quick and drop this here. So now we save this. Of course, now everything is, oh, of course, this is going to break because it's time diff details. Then we can save, then we can refresh, then everything's good. So this here is we can then just, again, I'm just like, totally improvising here because I think we can actually get a lot out of this. So the style here, actually what we could say is that if the color, so we can say color of the text and, and we're just going to do a really simple ternary where if estimate analysis, well, no, that's going to be a text field. 
I actually can't determine if it's number. So if I can do, oh, that's what I want to do. If task.completion is positive, is greater than zero, then we're going to make it a green. Otherwise, make it red. Yeah, for now. Let's just keep it simple. Does that work? OK, it's green. Excellent. We have a green task. OK, now, what if we do something way simpler than this? So I'm going to go ahead and set this down to one minute. We're going to go ahead and start the timer here. Oh, because it's already saved the other thing. Yeah, that's right. OK, stop. OK, let's, let's do this. So I'm going to add a new task, and we're going to call this login to account. OK? Login to account takes one minute. That's what we're going to say. So if we start this, the remaining time is this. Great. And we're just going to let it run for a little bit. So here, let's just go ahead and commit the changes that we've made so far. Ba -ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -ba -bum. OK? So the feature we've added is add basic time completion tracking for a task. That's ultimately what we did. So OK, we have another 30 seconds here. So in the meantime, while this is running, we can actually address what plan was referring to as far as like mutating the prop. So if we look at and take a look at it here, what we're going to notice here is that every time we're like when plan is referring to modifying the prop, it's stuff like this that I'm doing. Props.task.completion equals prop.task.remaining. This isn't well, <laughs> there's a lot of different mental models on it, and I'm not going to say exactly which one you should use at the moment because I think those patterns are still kind of being explored a bit. But in terms of like the classic pattern that we're used to with, oh, that worked. Okay, I'm really happy. I'll explain it in a little bit. Okay, so we have this now. The way we typically would do it inside of Vue 2 is that we would have the props being passed down. And then you ultimately make a copy of the props locally so that you make all your mutations there so that you actually have more like call it like a true source of truth for the component, which is like your copied reactive uh, component or data. And then once that data has changed, that gets echoed back up to the parent, which then passes the correct component down. And so it creates this kind of clean separation of concerns. And so I think in the time that we have, we're going to be able to make that happen. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this timer right here. And then let's go ahead and mark this as complete. Oh, it worked. I thought I was going to have to build a whole feature around this. I am so stoked it was that easy. So I don't know if anyone noticed. So when I had my brief little interruption there, because I, I noticed the countdown actually didn't stop. Like, I kind of expected the countdown to hit zero and then crash, but it didn't. It kept counting, which is actually what I, what, honestly, what I wanted because what you ultimately get is the ability to say, like, if you're working on a task, that you shouldn't have to go there and be like, oh, I need another five minutes to 10 minutes. I mean, granted, we could build UI to, and like, if people found that useful to, like, tag on an extra five minutes, but I'd argue to some extent that, like, if you estimated a task at 10 minutes and then you go past it, one, you shouldn't be penalized for it. If anything, it's just feedback. I know that the red here is very like jarring for some people because they feel like they did something wrong. But again, we could create the UI to be nicer. But essentially, the reason I think this is good is because what this ultimately allows you to do is track the task in terms of the actual time log so that when you're actually running analysis across a series of tasks, you could actually be like, every time you do this task, like logging into account, you keep saying it's going to take a minute. But actually, it, keeps, it clearly takes you more like two minutes every single time. And this is what I was talking about in regards to feedback and estimates, is that that's the only way we're going to get better, is if we can actually see when we're overestimating and when we are overestimating, how much are we overestimating by? Because again, I know that there are a lot of generic... Um, and like, there's a lot of generic advice as far as like, multiply your estimate times three and all that stuff. But like... Again, that, that makes so many assumptions about a person's mental model and how much they're estimating to begin with. Because someone who's not as confident in their skills, that they're like, oh, I think it's going to take me a week to get this done. And they're already semi-accurate. And then you're like, multiply that by three. You're asking them to tell their boss that like, oh, I think this thing is going to take basically a month to do. Like, this is what I have a problem with these sort of estimate things. And so if our tooling can help us give us better feedback without extra work, because I can just keep working until I'm done and then say hit complete. And then the analysis comes back to say, by the way, this took this much time. Then I as, a, I, as an individual, can tell myself like, oh, okay, I know why this was went over. Or more importantly, like, oh, 
that's good feedback that I went over by like twice as much as I estimated. Is that a unique situation? That's something I should change. And I think that sort of feedback loop is key in improving our ability to estimate things. Oh, I'm so happy that worked. The only thing though that we need to do, however, is that to make this a bit more accurate, is that remaining time is technically, this is no longer the case. So basically the text here, so okay, it says remaining time here. Remaining time actually needs to be a computed property that swaps out the text. So I'll just call it, um, for now I'll call it uh, display time text. We'll just call it something really simple. And so const display time text is a computed property because again, it's something that we want to leverage caching for because we don't want to have to manage that. And all we want to do is basically say, if, do, 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 let's see, completion, let's see, if remaining time, that's what we want. It process a task that remaining, right? If the remaining time is greater than zero, then what we're going to say is that it is, actually, we'll say greater than or equal to zero. Then we'll say uh, return time remaining. Otherwise, we will return additional time spent. Ah, so clean. I love it. Okay, so once again, I, I probably would move away from like the red because I think we just have this inherent, like visceral response to something being wrong. <laughs> and I, I, it's, I don't think people should be penalized for this. I think, yeah, I, I think I've said that three ways till Sunday at this point. Okay, this is very cool because at this point, we have a fully functioning time tracking app that can take in minutes granted. I would want to make this input from the perspective of like, rather than forcing them to type by minutes that people can actually enter in like one hour or whatever, that just requires some natural language processing or some standardization. So if you can imagine if we had the time to build this, essentially you create a text input and the text input would then take in like a time interval and you can standardize it. So let's say it's like one hour will be one H and then anything with minute, it's just going to be M. And then if you want to do seconds, then it'll be S. Then you would just need to, in your component, have logic to break down that natural text and then break that into something that like you can then calculate into seconds. And so date functions has a ton of stuff that we saw earlier. Definitely be sure to check that out. That will do uh, a ton for you as far as making sure you can really smooth out that user experience. But, oh, I am so stoked. I think that's ultimately that. And so, by the way, look at this app. I mean, I know it's not like the prettiest thing, but the fact that Pico CSS was just like a CDN drop and I didn't, I, it was mostly semantic HTML that's styling this, like absolutely love the framework and approach for this. So again, if you're looking for a CSS framework to try out in your next project, Pico CSS, I can highly recommend as far as just being able to scaffold things and get things working. Eventually you might want to change to something else, but as far as like getting started, it's awesome. Okay. So our next thing we want to do is just, I want to make sure this is goes ahead and gets populated for y'all. So do I need to do anything else? Let's see, let's go ahead and see what other, we did change some stuff. So let me go ahead and bring up the terminal a little bit higher. What do we change here? We added the, oh yes, that's right. So the feature here we had is add dynamic text display for feedback on time, type of time being displayed. Okay, great. Now, the last thing we're gonna do, let's go ahead and initialize this as the Netlify project because I'm gonna go ahead and make sure this is deployed so people can one, play around with it, and two, it makes it easier for uh, everyone to sort of check it out, play around with it, and then we can compare it to the source code and see how you might wanna use it for your own site. So we're gonna create and configure a new site with this under Ben code Zen. This will be called the effortless estimates. I think that's good enough. Great, no one has that. I win, v to build dist functions. Yes, all this stuff has been configured. And then with that, we can go ahead and let's see, let's add this commit. So let's config, add Netlify init configuration files, and then we can push this. Whoop, git push origin main. Excellent. Now if we run Netlify open, or in this case, shortcut NTL, which we often say nettle, nettle open will actually open up our dashboard to exactly the where we need to inside of the Netlify dashboard, which is great and honestly a command I use constantly. And so let's see, it is deploying the site right now. So we can go and check on the build process, installing lots and lots of stuff right now. So I'm not gonna worry too much about that but we can see everything's been configured already as far as that goes. So I am stoked. 
and it looks like it was published. Fantastic. So if we open this up. There we go. After the estimates. So farm teensin. Great. We can make this 10 minutes. We can start it. This is great. We can stop it. And then we can say login and compl or complete daily quests. And then hit enter. We can see it's all the way down here. And then wonderful. Let's say this is 120 minutes. Again, design stuff, we would need to fix some of that. But here you can see two hours is counting down exactly as we expect. We can stop it. Now we can complete it. Look, you completed it with that much to spare. And so I would definitely give more feedback in terms of that stuff. But excellent. This, this was a huge success. And I think that's that. So everything's published. And so let's go and switch over to the camera. So as far as the stream go, it was, as far as I'm concerned, 100% success in the ability to go ahead and see what it's like to build. We built, built the Vue 3 app from scratch, where we went ahead and really took a look and talked about different ways of which we could handle tracking estimates to help improve feedback to developers when they're going ahead, or again, not even developers, anyone who's looking to get stuff done. Uh, it, the fact that we could spin that up in basically an hour, uh, I mean, it says a lot to what we can also do with additional time to improve the user experience of those sort of things so that our tooling really can help us as far as the analysis. So, I mean, in my head, I'm thinking like beautiful data visualization graphs of like, if you can tag your task a certain way and then see that over a series of time, then you're ultimately going to get ability to see like trends of things. And you could also go as far as like, when you're estimating for certain projects, how your estimates are going. Like there's so many possibilities when you allow people to easily record the data just like that. Now, as always, people are gonna think like, well, what if like, you know, like if I accidentally forget to click stop and that kind of stuff. So the UX of it needs to be improved so that in case someone forgets to click stop for whatever reason, that they can go back and modify it so it's not like a hard coded thing. That's a whole thing that we can do to improve it. But overall, I think that does provide the foundation for really good estimation tools in terms of like, because other things I would like to improve as far as the UX goes includes things like, I don't think people should get penalized for the fact that like if they hit the 10 minute mark and let's say they take another 30 seconds to like switch context to like hit complete, I don't think that should be factored in as part of their estimate. That just means they just needed to context switch back. So for example, if I were to continue iterating on this experience, anything less than a minute past the original estimate, as far as I'm concerned, means that you actually managed to complete your work within your actual estimate. Once it goes past that minute, then it just lets you know you're kind of slightly over and then estimate it towards that. And so um, an app worth shouting out about actually that Cassidy, which I see was in the stream, kind of turned me on to is an app called Centered. And so they're all about basically helping you enter flow state. And I'll mention, I'll make sure to drop the, uh, the link to the app inside of the stream. And so it's been really interesting kind of working with their framework of what sort of they anticipate is a good user experience for helping people establish flow. And so part of this stream was inspired by what I've seen over there, but also ways that I could see that being useful to extend upon. Because if I say that I'm only going to take 10 minutes, to, you know, like this is actually a real thing to sort through my email. I get, I try to set aside 10 minutes. Usually I'm wrong. <laughs> I get caught up in something in the email and it goes way past 10 minutes. And at this point, the app doesn't really give me any feedback regarding that beyond like reminders, which I do really love about the centered app. So for example, if you set it at 10 minutes at the five minute marker, it'll go just, so you, just so you know, halfway to your task. Right. And then if you download the desktop app, it's, it's pretty interesting because it'll actually, if you give it access to like the apps you're currently using, it'll basically allow you to like, it'll detect things. So like if I'm cleaning up email and suddenly I'm on YouTube, it's like, I sense a disturbance in the force, you know, like, and it's asking you like, is YouTube distracting you or is Twitter distracting you? And if it's part of you cleaning up your email, yes, this is part of like, I'm actually staying on task. But if you say no, it'll basically keep pinging you until you get back on task. So it's that kind of stuff. I do, I really, I do really like what they did with that experience. It's just then beyond that, right? Once you've alerted them and the time is gone, how can then we took the time to track that data. We took the time to make those estimates. How can we use that to make ourselves more effective at using our time? So anyhow, with that, I think that's it. That's a wrap for this session. As always, all of the resources that we talked about today will be included in the show notes below. If you have any questions or any feedback regarding the show and you want to see specific topics, would love to see those comments down below. So with that said, Plan, Sergio, View Gilmore, Radio, Jacob, Cassidy, um, it's a pleasure having you all here. So with that, 
Hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you all later. Bye, everybody. <laughs>